How many of you would make the testimony or give testimony this morning that Christ lives in you? Come to know Jesus Christ. He dwells in your heart. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Do you remember the day? Do you remember the moment when you asked him to be the Lord of your life, when you invited him in? So it's a wonderful moment. You should never forget it. But let me ask you this. Is Christ being mummified in you or amplified? Is he being somewhat hidden away as a bit and piece of your life buried somewhere in there? Or is he living and active and stretching all of the boundaries and borders of your life, mummified or amplified? Let me say it in a different way. Is the sound of Jesus' voice buried in the background of the soundtrack of your life, or is his voice like an electric guitar lead? Does he carry the melody of your life, or have you relegated him to just being part of the chorus? Well, let me say it another way. Is your faith static, or is it growing? And another way. Are you fruitless or fruitful? We're talking about living an amplified life, walking through 2 Peter 1.5, where Peter talks about we've come to faith. Now, with faith in Christ, we need to supplement that faith or add to that faith. The whole idea here is amplify, add to, add to component by component by component by component. Keep stacking these things up so that you have a larger voice, a bigger footprint, a greater influence all the days of your life growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. See, according to Peter, an authentic faith is ever-growing. It's an ever-growing life force. It's a life under constant amplification. God is constantly turning it up. Constant development, constant growth. This is the will of God for us Sadly, the will of God is not always done in us. The goal, the dream, the desire, the longing of my heart is to see a church that will rise up with this passion, to see the will of God being fully accomplished in lives. Peter writes, after reminding his friends that God's divine power has been grant, or has granted us all things, God's divine power has granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Isn't that a wonderful, isn't that a wonderful promise? To know that God has, in his grace, he has granted us everything we need for life and godliness. That's a pretty wonderful promise. Peter steps right off of that and says, for this very reason, 2 Peter 1.5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Last week we talked about virtue being moral excellence, or moral standing. Otherwise, in other words, you've come to know Jesus Christ. Now bring your living into line with who he is now in your life. His goodness, his greatness should be seen in you. His virtue, his excellence to your faith add virtue, his moral courage. And virtue, supplement virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Those are eight amplifiers there. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a powerful promise. They keep you from being ineffective if they're growing in you. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he's been cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. That's a stunning statement. If you practice these qualities, you'll never fall. For in this way, they'll be richly provided for you an entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your faith needs to be amplified, plugged in, built upon. And Peter gives us these eight amplifiers. 
Paul, when he is writing to the Galatians in chapter 4 and 19 of the book that bears that title, Paul writes, he says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. Paul did not consider the work to be nearly accomplished with a confession of faith. But that the confession of faith simply opened the door to walking with the Lord, wherein now Christ is being formed. When he talks about Christ being formed in you, it is a powerful, powerful motif for us. We should look, we should look at life this way, that every step that I take and every day that I live, I want Christ to be formed to a greater degree in me until people see less of me and more of him. I literally want his character now to be stamped upon me. One of the Christmas carols that we sing says, Adam's likeness now efface, stamp thine image in its place. Adam's likeness, my human nature, now efface, stamp thine image in its place. That's a process. That's part of ongoing growth, looking more and more, behaving more and more, living more and more like Jesus. Paul said to the Corinthians, inwardly, he said, we are being renewed day by day. Is that a spiritual reality for you, or is that simply a theological theory? Are you being renewed day by day? See, the Christian life is more than an experience. The Christian life is a relationship. One of the biggest problems that we have in really understanding how we're supposed to live this life is to recognize that it is, it is not about the experience apart from relationship. You can't, you can't tear the two apart. The experience leads us into relationship, and it is ongoing. So you can't talk about, I came down to the altar, and I gave my life to Jesus, and I had my experience, and I'm going to heaven. I got my ticket punched. You are blind as to what this life is that you've stepped into. That's simply that's simply where you stepped into life. Now, what have you done since you stepped into life? Because as glorious as the transformation was when you stepped from darkness to life, from death unto light, as wonderful as that is, there's this glorious life that he wants to unpack for you. And if you are living with a sense of, got my ticket punched, going to somehow make it to heaven, rather than Christ is being formed in me, well, you're missing everything the Bible has to say about discipleship. Because a disciple is the follower who follows after, imitates, and literally becomes, and then reproduces the teacher. We're called to take a journey with Christ. We're to learn of him daily. We're to touch the world through his love constantly. And if our faith is not living and moving and reaching and stretching and growing, then Christ remains hidden, a prisoner to our own inertia, a mummy that will only be uncovered if some archaeologist stumbles upon us someday and digs down deep inside to say, oh yeah, he once had an experience. Christ should be fully revealed and moving in power right now at a greater dimension than you have known. This is the way it's supposed to work. The late Dallas Willard said, what the church really needs is not more people, nor more money, better programs, more, educated, or more education, or more prestige. The church has always been at its best when it has had little or none of these. All it needs to fulfill Christ's purpose in the earth is the quality of life he makes real in the life of his disciples. Willard, this is a brilliant, this is really a brilliant assessment of, of where we've missed it within the church. We, we need to understand that what we really need is not all of the window dressing. What we really need is the essence of Christian life. The quality of life he makes real in the life of his disciples. So what is this quality of life he makes real in the life of his disciples? It's a faith that never ceases in its development. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. This word knowledge is a very broad word in our language, but it was a lot more concise in the Greek. 
Wherever you find knowledge in the scripture, it's generally one of two Greek words. The first one is Sophia, and it has a very broad, very broad meaning. It's, it's a wide knowledge of things, human and divine, and their causes. It's a good word for it would be understanding, just a, a broad life understanding, that word Sophia. It's also translated quite often wisdom. You know, there is a difference between the person who knows how something works and the person who knows how to make it work. I know how a bicycle works. I can tell you about all of the parts. I testified to this a couple weeks ago. I can tell you about all of, the, all of the parts. I know where it goes and I know how it's supposed to work. But I told you also that I am a disaster of a bicycle mechanic. I break everything I get my hands on at least once, usually twice. I've stripped every bolt there is to strip on a bike and I've broken carbon. I've broken titanium. There is very little that I haven't completely ruined because while I know all of these parts, I really don't have the wherewithal or the experience to know how to put it all together. Well, Sophia is this broad sense of knowledge that kind of gives you the idea as to how these things are all supposed to work, how it all flows. You get a vision of how it all flows together. The second word is very close to it, but it's a little bit different. It's gnosis. And gnosis, this Greek word gnosis, is about practical knowledge. It's the knowledge and a sense of knowing what to do in any given situation or, I think it was Barclay who said it so well, this gnosis is the knowledge of how to deal with life. How many of you would like a great big box of gnosis today? I'll take a box, Pastor. I'll take a, I'll take a 55 gallon barrel of gnosis to know how to deal with life. So this morning I'm gonna tell you how you can know how to deal with life. Let me expand and paraphrase Peter and then we'll dive right into it. What we've covered so far, what, re, what Peter is saying is make every effort to add to your faith. So you've got faith. Now that faith is going to need virtue or moral courage. You're going to have to stand up and be counted. You're going to have to be real. You're going to have to have integrity. So to your faith, make sure that your faith leaks over into your behaviors so that you have integrity and you make your stand. So add to your faith, moral courage and excellence and knowledge, know how to deal with life. How do I deal with life? Where do I get this practical knowledge? How can I learn how to deal with life? Let me suggest three ways. These are almost no brainers. The first is reading slash hearing. The second is following. The third is practicing. This is basically how we acquire knowledge. Reading, hearing, following, and practicing. Let's, let's pull it apart a little bit. Reading and hearing. The Christian life is a massive schoolroom that is built around one text, the Bible. Look at it this way. Say we just take this auditorium right now and we... Uh, we duplicate it on this side so that we're seated completely in the round. And this is our, our Christian library, okay? So here we are all the way around and we've got this big center dais up here. And in the middle, we have the Word of God. This is our library. There are no books on the outer wall. There are no books in the chairs. There's no books anywhere for the Christian life. The central text is right in the midst of it all. It's the Bible. Christians cannot live, they cannot grow without the Word of God. They cannot grow. I always remember when Madagascar was in such incredible drought, and especially the churches were under such persecution there, when my, my cousin Rob Hoskins arrived in Madagascar and asked the superintendent there, what is it that you need in your churches? What, what can we do for you? We need to get some food relief in here. We've got organizations that do all of this. And the, and the superintendent of Madagascar says, oh, brother Rob, please hear me. Hear me, he said. We need the word of God. We have learned to eat grass, but we need the word of God. The church cannot, we simply cannot survive without God's word. So we are a massive schoolroom built around one text, and that is, that's the Bible. 
The Bible can't be compared, nor should it be compared, to even a billion other books. It's unique because it's alive. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than the two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, the discerning of thoughts and even intentions of the heart. The word of God is the manual. The word of God is the book that fully explains who we are, how we function, and how we can be at our best. And if you've never read the manual, don't be surprised if you can't work the machine. How many of you know that by some other particular discipline. You know, if you, if you don't believe me, those of you who have no skill whatsoever in mechanical things, just get a toolbox and go home and start taking your car apart. You'll understand what I'm saying. You'll understand what I'm saying. The book is alive. Eugene Peterson, well known for his paraphrase, The Message, which I dearly love. You know how it all started, Eugene Peterson, in, as a pastor. He was a theologian, Bible college professor, but also a pastor. And as he was pastoring this congregation, he realized these people don't know the Word of God. And as he got close to the people, he realized they really struggle with, at that point, 1611 King James was the most common the most commonly held translation. He said, they're really struggling because I don't, I'm not sure they're understanding. He said, I'm going to take the book of Galatians and I am going to use the idioms and the metaphors that Americans are used to. I'm also going to use updated English language. And he was a scholar enough to be able to rightly divide the, the word of truth. So he said, I'm going to do my Hebrew and my Greek work and I'm going to produce for Galatians a study where I translate in the American vernacular the American form of English, all of Galatians. And he distributed it to his church and they absolutely loved it and it leaked out. And before long, publishers were banging on his door and saying to him, you've got to do this. You've got to do this to all of the Bible. He said, you're crazy. Who has the time? He said, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. It took him six years, but he finished the message. What a gift. What a gift to us. Eugene Peterson knew the Word of God. He was an expert in handling the Word of God and interpreting the Word of God. He was a man who lived in and lived for the Bible. Here's what he said, looking at our emerging culture in the mid-2000s, and it's even more acute today. He said, there's an enormous interest these days in the soul. Isn't that true? The soul and the spirit. People think they're, I have people all the time saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm not into organized religion, but I consider myself to be spiritual. I say, oh really, what's that look like? <laughs> it's always amazing to hear what that looks like. It looks like most things are, that are spiritual. Anybody got any spiritual paintings in your house? Anybody drive here in a spiritual car? If it's spiritual, you can't see it, right? People say they're spiritual. You ask them, to, what does that look like? Define what that looks like. They can't tell you. But they are, they say they're spirit. We have a tremendous interest, he says, in, in spirit, in the spiritual. But he said, there's not a corresponding revival in the interest in our holy scriptures. It's our undoing. We went through a leadership change two years ago in the Assemblies of God. We are about 12,000 churches, about 35,000 credential holders here in the United States. About 3 million people attend Assemblies of God churches, as you have today, every Sunday. The leader of that movement is not only the leader of that 3 million here in the U.S., but we are almost 70 million around the world now. Our daughter churches have long long since passed us in size and growth. The Assemblies of God in Brazil and Argentina, some of these are just, they're massive. But our superintendent is the titular head of, of this 70 million people. And when, when Doug came into office, and by the way, he's younger than I am. He's younger than I am. And you know, I'm like 41, right? Actually, I'm quite a bit older than that, but Doug is in his, he's in his mid-50s, so he's, he's younger, he's younger than I am, and a, a wonderful leader, a powerful leader. In laying out his agenda now as a new generation leader, because generally our big organizations have been led by people who are 65, 70, 75, even 80 years old. And so for an organization like ours to suddenly be shifted into the hands of someone who is in their early to mid-50s 
It's a big change. And you would think that Doug would have come on the scene and given what young people talk about or younger generations are talking about, you would think that he would have chosen to place relevance as a guiding priority to make dramatic changes in generations for, for the years to come. But when Doug stood before the general presbytery after he was elected, I was overwhelmed when I heard him say, I've been praying as to, as to what the Lord would have me do. I've been praying as to what we should be doing. And he said, I'm establishing today for the tenure of my leadership here as a superintendent, biblical literacy will be my number one priority. And then he went on powerfully to lay out, here is what is happening and here's what it's producing in our churches and in our culture. And if we do not have an awakening, if we do not have an awakening and a re-embracing of the word of God at the center of all things, we will literally starve to death for a lack of bread. The Bible's the most translated book in the world today. No conceivable book could ever, could ever pass it. Isn't it amazing that the most translated, published, quoted, and revered book in the world today, millions of Christians haven't read it. Or if they have, it's only little small pieces of the pie. There are people I know who sit under my voice week after week after week, and what I preach is the only word that they hear or read in an entire week. And if they are really faithful churchgoers these days, say, let's say they hit 42 Sundays, how much of the scripture are they receiving and how much are they internalizing? It's led us to the point where biblical illiteracy is one of our greatest challenges. How should we read the Bible to gain understanding and how to deal with life? Actually, the answer is there for us, not by looking forward or even by looking around us, but by looking back. 1,400 years ago in the monastic movement, the Catholics came up with the concept of Lectio Divina, divine reading, a means of reading the Word of God to gain practical understanding rather than to pursue scholarly dissection. See, scholars will sit down and they'll study the word. They'll study it in the Greek. They'll study it in the Hebrew. They'll parse every word. They'll search, con they'll do all of this work to say, we really think this is what it really means. And, and they often publish all kinds of papers that no one can read and, or no one can understand when they read them. I know because I've written some of those. I've written stuff I know nobody understands. I, I know that's been their testimony. But the monastic movement said, no, we need to read God's word to gain a practical understanding of it. And so the monks developed, uh, the monks developed this uh, incredible way of dealing with the scripture, Lectio Divina. Four parts. The first Lectino is read. Read. Just read the text. This is not, by the way, this is not a hurried grab a verse Check the box on your read the Bible in a year thing. Have you ever been engaged in something where you're supposed to read it and so, so you are just reading as fast as you can so you can check the box and you can go on? That doesn't count. That doesn't count. If some of you have taken speed reading so that you can get more of the Bible into your life, I doubt if it's really helping you. Because the Word of God requires us, the Word of God requires us to read it, to consider it. It's not hurried. It's not just complete the year, it's taking time and locking out everything else but the Word of God. Hard for us to do, isn't it? We've got a generation that's come up that if you turn off Spotify, they freak out. Going into a restaurant that doesn't have music blaring, they, it's, it's kind of like, are you open yet? And they're, they're used to having you know, a massive amount of of input coming at them through their, through their cell phone, through their, their smartphone, and they consider themselves to be excellent at multitasking, except for the 
cyclists they run over every once in a while. And, but they read, you know, the idea of reading is I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm reading, but really they've got a whole bunch of things going on while they're eating their face and maybe getting their, or feeding their face and getting their hair done. I don't know, but they, they got a lot of stuff going on. Look, if you want to read the word of God, you've got to shut everything else out. Let me just get kind of here on my grumpy old man pulpit and tell you, we need to respect the word of God that much. We need to respect it. That this is, do you know what it's cost for God to give us such a full revelation of his word? Almost everybody in that book gave their life. They gave their life that we might have this testimony born of the Spirit of God. So we have the Word of God. We need to take time with it, block every... So it's just, first of all, it's just read. So the monks would just read. The second step was mediteo, which was meditate. We meditate on the text. This is really going from the words of the text to the world of the text. So it's it's like when you're reading a verse in the Bible and you go, man, that is really rich. Read the verses before it. Read the verses after it. Maybe even a chapter back or a chapter ahead, but start looking to how concepts fit together, especially within like Paul's letters or in the Gospels. Look for it elsewhere, but we read and we meditate on the Word of God. We let it sink in and we're seeing the bigger picture. So we, we read with meditation. We know the scripture well, I think, from Psalm 1, 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Wait a minute for a moment. Oh, I just wonder, how many don't know this text? When I was a kid growing up, I know in my father's church, if he'd started quoting that verse, the entire congregation would be quoting the verse with him. Because biblical literacy was at a different level then. I'm not saying that to condemn. I'm simply telling you. We've lost this. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of mockers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law doth he meditate day and night. And what difference does that make? Well, he will be like a tree planted by rivers of water, bringing forth his fruit in season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. And at the key of it, or at the core of it, is this meditating day and night. It was Eugene Peterson who gave me, I think, the best understanding of meditation, of what it means to meditate on God's word, when he he took the word uh, for meditate in the scripture and pulled it apart to its original meaning. And it goes back to, have you ever seen, have you ever seen a dog with a bone and it's the, the dog owns the bone now, right? It's the dog's bone. You don't take the, you try and take the bone away and the dog will take your arm off. But if you're not messing with the dog and he has that bone, have you seen a, a dog sit there and just gnaw on that bone? It's just getting right down to the marrow of it, that's the root of the concept of the Greek word meditation. You just gnaw on that and you are delighted. You look at, that dog is happy when that dog, and that dog, as a matter of fact, that dog even growls a little bit as he's gnawing away on the gut. He is so, he is, just, it's like he short circuits. And he just loves it. Loves it. Don't ask me to do that again. That probably won't appear on the video, but he loves it. He just loves it. He's just gnawing away on that bone. That's the idea. So when we read God's Word, we don't just read it. We meditate on it. And then we get to orator, oratio. And oratio is pray. Now we pray the text. Let me just, I don't have time to unpack it in depth, but let me just give you the oversight. I find out that I have a... Uh, some type of an issue with my body. The doctors say, you've got a leaky valve and, and we, we've got a real problem here. And they say, what do you want to do? I say, well, first, I, first I want to pray. So, you know, I go, I, I go home and I sit down in my chair down in the living room and I reach over and I grab the word of God and what scriptures do I begin to look for? Healing. I want to read every word I can find in the book. Some of you have done it. Sherry will tell you. Where are you, Sherry? There you are. My, my Sherry will tell you that God healed her. God healed her and radically, dramatically trans lifted her out of a 
pit by the word of God as, as the word began to come alive and as even as she would pray the word of God. So I'm sick in body and I open the scripture and, and I read. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Really? Then I start reading about Jesus everywhere he went and he healed them. And he said, I've never, I've seen such faith like this centurion and he healed him. And I, I start reading the scriptures and before long, before long, reading that in the text, reading about those things, it begins to come out of me in my prayers. Oh, Father, as I come before you today, I pray that you would touch me because Lord, I want to reach out and touch you now like that woman with the issue of blood who just wanted to touch the hem of your garment. And the Bible says when she touched you, what's happening? The Bible is coming alive in me and it's coming out of my prayers. And the monks understood that the word of God can't live out here someplace. It's got to live in here. Somehow the word of God has got to get past this and it's got to get deep into the core of our being until it begins to sweat out of us in our prayers. They understood this. And the fourth part it's completio, and completio is this idea of contemplation. How now do I put this to work in my life? How do I live out this text? And the monks, they would start with reading. They'd milk everything. They'd meditate upon and get everything they could get out of it. It would start flowing out of their prayer life. And as it's flowing out of their prayer life, it changed the way that they lived. It changed the attitudes that they held and they understood. It's been lost to us in this culture, but they understood this will lead you into a holy life before God, a deeper relationship through Jesus. I make full use of digital tools. I, I love preaching from an iPad. From the first time I ever used an iPad for preaching, I've never preached with anything else. Never gone back to paper notes, not one, never want to. I just, I love what technology can do. But when I study, I want an open Bible in front of me. I don't want a four inch screen. Because I'm, I, there's something about it. You say, well, that's just you. It's a generational thing. I think it's, I, there's something more than that. I want something that is utterly other to come flowing into my life. And that cell phone is not utterly other. I've got to tell you what this cell phone will do. Right now, it's controlling sound monitors when you're playing bass. So I, I, right now I've got, because I was playing a few moments ago, so there, it's, it's doing that. Now I can, I can hit a button here, and actually I'm very concerned to know what's happening there. I can hit a button and I can check in on the Tour de France. I'm not going to do that. You know how much I love you? I can also send a text and I, I you, you got one of these and they are, there's nothing other about them. They're everything. There's nothing individual. There's nothing unique about. So what I'm trying to say is when we are studying the word of God, when I talked about everything else gets pushed out of our lives, you probably need to turn off your smartphone, shut down the ringer, get in another room, get the word in front of you, but shut out all of that other stuff that will intrude. Because I found that this thing more and more, it keeps telling me things I don't want to know. It notifies me of all kinds of, I can't shut the notifications off fast enough. It's just a moment ago. Just, it in my pocket and I know what it's asking me. How was your sleep last night? I don't care. <laughs> I slept just fine. I'm tired of reporting to you and I can't get it turned off. It's my Swiss army knife. I can search the internet, communicate on multiple platforms. I can entertain myself checking on the tour. I can take pictures and I can Facebook and I can Instagram and I can, t I can tweet. I mean, I can do it all. And I've even got Bible apps on here. And the only time I'll ever use them is if I'm searching for something fast or I'm someplace away, but I, there's a verse and where is that? I'll, I, I'll use them sometimes for that. But I've got to tell you, there's no substitute to sitting down with the word of God and wearing the thing out. Let me ask you this. When you die, will you leave a worn out Bible? I'm in a lot of death rooms. It's just part of the, it's part of the life. I'll, um, I'll be there where people are near death or they've just died. Families gathered in the room afterwards. 
I don't know how many times in, in the 40 years that I've been walking out this life, but it's, it's a lot. And there's something that I have noticed, and it's only been in the last few years that I've started to even look for it. I can pretty much tell you about the, the dead man or the dead woman in the bed, but what I see in the death room. Often I'll go in, and here's what I'll see. First of all, them. They're laid out and departed, and their families are weeping. And over, probably on a side table here somewhere, there's a Bible, thick study Bible, gold leaf edge, you know, on all of the pages. And I know I walk over, I lay my hand on them, I touch that Bible, and you get a sense that you don't want to be obvious, but you get a sense if I pick that Bible up and crack it open, it's going to smell like a brand new Bible. It's going to feel like the cover's never been opened. Because what happened is when Aunt Sally got sick, the kids said, well, let's, put a, let's, keep, let's bring a Bible. They've used it like a talisman. She's never read it. She's never studied it. She's never worn the thing out. She doesn't know anything about it. And it testifies, in that moment, it testifies. I've been in other rooms where someone has just gone home to be with Jesus. I've known their lives. And without, without fail, when they are a vibrant, full life saint of God who has lived with passion and purity before God, there'll be a Bible laying on the side table where they've just passed away. There'll be a Bible there. And that Bible will be absolutely destroyed, worn out. The spine will be broken. The leather on the sides of it, the older than the leather will be thumbed where they open it every time. The gold leaf will all be gone. Pages will be loose and coming out. Sherry's got a Bible, a Bible that has been so important to what the Lord did in her life a few years ago. It's just become that core Bible. I don't dare touch the thing. Because I'm sure that again, you heard what I do to bicycles. I touch that Bible, it'll go to dust. It'll go to dust. She also has her grandmother, saint of God. She has her grandmother's Bible. That Bible is pretty much worn out. I've got my grandfather's Bible. I've got my father's last preaching Bible. They are absolutely worn out. Let me ask you this. Are you going to leave a worn out Bible? How are you doing on that? How are you doing on that? I, I would assume that you've got one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five Bibles in your house. Have you worn any of them out? I'm not trying to condemn people, please, if I'm coming across heavy. I'm not trying to be heavy on you this morning, but I do want you to understand that the Word of God will transform you. And that Bible, if I asked your kids, Mom or Dad's Bible, is it worn out? Here's a question for them. Mom and Dad Bible, can you find it in the house? Do they know where it is? When you die, will you leave a worn out Bible? That alone will indicate whether or not your faith has been a growing faith, an amplified faith. It will speak to the power, the quality, and the impact of your life. So we gain this practical knowledge by learning, by reading, and hearing. Okay, two more, and they're much shorter than the first one. Trust me, I'm your pastor. Second step is how do we learn, how do we learn that... that where it makes a real practical difference in our life. We learn by following. We learn, has anyone here ever been apprenticed? Apprenticed is all of, be, to be apprenticed is to be a follower, where you follow after somebody and you, I, I see it all the time at, at a restaurant. I, forgive me, I'm just being honest, but I roll my eyes when here she comes to wait on us at the table and she's got that person in training in tow with her. And it's awkward. It's awkward for everyone, isn't it? It's kind of like, Here's Lisa, and she's just here for training, and she's just kind of standing there. You don't know whether to engage her. You don't know what to do. Pull up a chair, sit down, let's get to know you. We come to this restaurant. Oh, you just, it's, it's awkward, and what, but what's going on? How do they train? How do they train that, that, that server? They train that server to walk in the steps, literally, in the steps. Do what I do. It's all about following. Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In another translation, it translates, I think the vernacular is a bit better. It says, follow me as I follow Christ. It's impossible to understand the scriptures apart from the concept of following. What did Jesus say to his disciples when he called them out? Follow me. You can learn words, you can learn concepts, you can create theological frameworks, but it's meaningless. It's meaningless and it's powerless if you are not following. Is it in, it's in following the Christ revealed in scriptures 
that the way, and that's what we're after, the way to live, it's in following the Christ revealed in the scriptures that the way becomes familiar to us. Let me illustrate it for you this way. I grew up with a dad who loved to fish. He, he really loved fishing. It relaxed him and he loved, he was an outdoorsman, loved to be outdoors. So I grew up with a dad who just loved to fish. Strangely, I never became a fisherman. I didn't love to fish as much as my dad loved to fish, but I loved being with my dad. So I fished. I fished. The greatest memories of my childhood with my father, even in my adolescence, even as a young teen, even as an early teenager, all seemed to revolve around fishing. Up a brook someplace, in a boat, on a bank, somewhere in the ocean, rivers, lakes. He just liked to fish, and I spent time with him fishing. And isn't it funny how memories stick in your mind. Some of them are kind of murky and you can pull them out from time to time. Some of them become so shadowed that you can't really fully grasp them. But there are a few from our childhood that are so crystal clear. It's like they're high def. And from my, from my boyhood, I have some of those high def moments with my dad that are absolutely stuck. They don't fade and I'm so grateful for them. Most of them revolve around fishing. The first one, the first one is our house on Clearview Row. We moved before I, was, uh, before I was five. But I still remember that house. I have clear memories of that house. And one memory in particular, I'm standing at, the, at the, the large window in the living room and I'm looking down the hill. We were The house sat up on a hill. I'm looking down the hill to where my dad is putting all of the fishing gear in the back of his 1962 Chevy to go fishing with his friends. It was a man trip, not a boy trip. I was four years old. I remember it like it's yesterday. I remember it because I'm standing there and I am inconsolable. I'm weeping because dad's going fishing without me. He thought, he thought he slipped out quietly enough but I never sleep or slumber. At least I didn't when I was that young. You couldn't, you, early morning, I have a grandson right now who's exactly like me. My namesake, David Jefferson, God help us, that boy is up. He's up before the chickens. He's up before, he's up before anyone. He's making his coffee. God help us, I don't know. We're, we're gonna be judged, I know, someday for that, but he's, he's making his coffee. He's worrying about the weather and he wants to check all the sports scores. <laughs> he's nine years old. Uh, anyway, anyways, um, I was four. My dad was going to go fishing. Dad was fishing without me and uh, broke my heart. See, that's how it is. When, when you love him, you just want to be with him. I'm talking about the father as much as my father. Second vignette or the second image that pops into my mind that is so clear, it's a happier one still, but it often plays on the screen of my, screen of my memory. I was far too hyper as a kid, if you can imagine, six, seven. I was too hyper to be in a rowboat for two or three hours um, drifting around a cove someplace. And so dad recognized that, that I had a lot of energy to burn. So he started doing a lot of brook fishing in New Brunswick and we would tramp up these pristine untouched, probably nobody's ever been back here before. I mean, just gorgeous play up around Hatfield Point on the Belle Isle River in New Brunswick. And we would hike up a stream, uh, you know, up from the, like the, the river level, then hike the stream up into the, into the hills. And the higher we got in the hills, we'd come upon some pretty big pools. And the brook trout were, abs these speckled trout were unbelievable. The water was so cold your hands would go blue almost in, in the water. And when, you, when you'd catch those speckled trout, they came out and they were, they were ice cold. It's like they were almost frozen. And with Dad, we carried those old-fashioned wicker baskets and we would carve fresh moss out from the riverbank, wet it in that ice-cold water. And those fish, we'd throw those, those, um, those trout 
into the wicker basket and we'd kind of wrap them in that sod to keep them, keep them wet and keep them cold and it worked better than a cooler, better than a freezer. And those, those trips with my dad tramping up a, a brook, those are just so clear in, in my mind. I've mentioned before that I was a little bit of a mess. And so I'd get my line snagged as we were tramping our, you, you go up a stream, there's no path here. You know, no bridges, the Corps of Engineers hasn't been there to do anything. You are tramping up a rough old brook stream and is, or, or, or brook, and you're, you're making your way up over the rocks. You've got to cross over the stream in some places because you can't get around it because of the highness of a bank and the huge stones and that type of thing. And so dad would zigzag his way up and here I would come along behind him. And you know what happens when you're trying to cross a brook like that and you've got a brook, you've got wet rocks and mossy wet rocks. You know what happened to me? I, it was, I, it, it, we were never, a, we were never a quarter of a mile up up a brook someplace, and I'd already been into here, and so my boots were full of water. And Dad would stop, and we'd pull off the socks and wring them out, and he'd dump the boots out, and everything would come back on, and you felt kind of yucky. But I, I knew it wouldn't be long, and sure enough, I was back in. This time I was right up to my waist. I was generally, I, I generally needed to be wrapped in moss and carried out at the end of the day because I, I was so cold from being in the being in the water, slipping into the water. And by the time I got there, I was using a just to total mess, but I just wanted to be with my dad. I, I remember one trip in particular. This is just, I, I want to bless his memory. This is my dad. You know, I, I'd somehow hooked my, my little pole. I'd hooked it in the branch of a tree someplace and the, you know, the little catch on the, the pole had gone open and I had strung line for a mile at least all the way up back and forth across. And when I finally, he finally saw it, you know, I had about, you know, three wrappings left on the thing. So what does he do? He comes across, he takes the, takes the, the, the pole and he starts and all the way back down again, all the way back up again. He did stuff like that all the time for me. And I, I wasn't really into it that much, but I'll tell you, I sure wanted to be, I sure wanted to be with him. Dad, he had a brilliant solution though to this problem because after, you, after you've done that two or three trips, you know, it gets old. And so I, he said to me, Dave, he was the only one in my boyhood, he's the only one who ever called me Dave. Everybody called me David or I had a nickname that will go unspoken. But he, <laughs> called, me, he called me Dave and, and uh, he said, Dave, follow me and put your feet exactly where I put my feet. Can you do that? Yeah, Dad. I learned by following. And I found out my dad was amazing. He would, uh, he'd step out and he would test every rock. And when he kind of checked out the area, he'd look ahead and, and then he would step onto that rock and he'd have two or three steps already planned out and he'd just chunk, chunk, chunk. Never jumping, just moving his weight enough to move him across that stream. And I found that if I put my feet in the same places and did the same thing that he did, I got to where he was going. I learned how to follow my dad. He was magic with that stuff. And by the end of my sixth or seventh summer, I was pretty magic too with all that. I learned by following. Listen, if you want to live an amplified life, you've got to be a follower of Jesus. You can't just know about him. You have to be a follower. Last thing and we're done. Say, we're done. It's just something about proclaiming that, isn't it? We're done. Just hold with me. Final part of this is practice. Most of us have heard the verse from Philippians 4, 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, right, and pure. Think on these things, 4, 8. But people don't take time to read 4, 9. In 4, 9, Paul says, what you've learned and received and heard and seen. So learned, received, heard, seen, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things. We call the body of work that a doctor does his practice. Isn't that interesting? Because that's what doctors do, you know. They practice. How many of you would go to a doctor who had no practice? Stop and think about it. You got, you got that leaky valve thing going on, really needs to be fixed. How many of you would be comfortable going to a doctor who'd never replaced one before, but he had watched a lot of YouTube? <laughs> Welcome to the world of the millennial. 
So give me YouTube, I'll figure it out. There are some things you only learn by doing. There are some things you only learn by practice. We put our trust in the, in the hopes that the doctor's practice will be perfect. Will be perfect. Practice makes perfect. So we've got to put it into practice. Keep doing right things. Best advice that was ever given me by a fellow preacher wasn't about preparing a message. It was about life. Keep doing right things. Practice them over and over and over and over again. They will be internalized like muscle memory. They will become a spiritual memory. You will walk in safety. You will walk in peace. You will walk in joy if you just keep doing right things. Say, man, I want to love my life. I want to love my wife with a passion. Well, love her right now where you are. Love her with everything you've got. Do the very best that you can. You may have all kinds of problems right now, and your radar might be a mess because you guys have been through so much. But start right now loving her where you are and what you love her. You love her this much. It's amazing. If you'll be faithful, you'll that love will grow. I love my wife with all of my heart. There's nobody in the world, nobody in the world who could come anywhere close to this woman. Outside of Jesus, she's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And he was so involved in her completing my life. It's a a powerful thing. How have we got there? It hasn't always been easy. And I'll tell you, there have been times when it's been a struggle for her far more than me. But this I know, you keep loving and doing loving things. Let me just help some of you guys who are looking for a silver bullet. Let me just help you. Can I help you? I'm your friend. I really am your friend. Just act loving. So I don't feel it in my heart. Well, what do you got to lose? That's a bad place to be. You're a man who made a covenant before God to love her as Christ loves the church. And you, you, got a big, you got a big deal going right here. You got an issue. You need to fix it. How about just giving this a shot? Just act like you love her. Just start there. I found this. The more I act lovingly towards people, lo and behold, before long, I actually really love them. I've had some stinkers to deal with at Calvary Church through the years, let me tell you. (laughs) I've had a few people come along that are not easy to love. I'll be done in a minute. I told you we're done. It's just a second. Sherry, come on up and help us. I'm ready, but I'm not going to identify anyone or look in your section, but I have, I have, uh, I have had, I've had some, I've had some people that have pushed me and tested me. And we always blame it on third person. My flesh rises up. Why do we do that? We blame it on our flesh. As though, I don't know you except for your flesh. Well, it's it's the flesh rising up in me. I got to tell you, the flesh is you, sis. The flesh is you, brother. It's you. Why do we always say it's my flesh? I just have to tell you that there there are times that my response to people have not been, it, it hasn't been what it's needed to be. And the Lord has chastened me, saying, I've, com- I've committed these people to your care. I've given, you, I've given them to you as a gift. And I go, really? Thanks, Lord. I'm thinking of a woman right now who has departed from this life. She's with Jesus. She and her husband, when they came through the doors of our church, were two of the most obnoxious people I've ever met. They needed needed a counselor. They needed a physician. They needed a, a pastor. Did I mention they needed a counselor and medication? They needed, they, they needed, they needed everything. And have you ever met someone who's, I pray it's not me, but have you ever met someone who's just, they're, they're kind of repulsive to you, maybe not physically, but there's just something about them. You just don't click at all. Man, I had a crisis early. We were over on Jefferson Road now. 
That narrows the field for those of you who are over there. By the way, it wasn't Keith and Cindy. I just said, <laughs> so Cindy's looking at me like this. No, she's gone now, Cindy. It's not you. I've heard people say, well, I don't love them. I, I, you know, I, I love them in Jesus. I just don't like them that much. What does that mean? We say the stupidest things. Why are you laughing, Dennis? You pastored for all of those. You know what I'm talking about? I had a crisis one night. We had Sunday night services still back then, and they were people like that show up every time the doors were open. The cool people won't come, but man, those people, they're there every time the doors are open. <laughs> you know. It doesn't sound very good, does it? I'm not proud of this. Everybody left that night. We had those old wooden altars and I, it, it troubled me so much. I went down and knelt at that altar and I called her name before the Lord. And I said, Lord, every time I see her, I just have this reaction. And I know I'm not coming across well because I wasn't, I, I just knew it. Lord, will you help me somehow love her? Something clicked inside of me. I felt in that moment, if I will take the step, God will give me the power to love her. To love her. The strangest thing began to happen. They didn't change a whole lot. They were still as strange as they had ever been. But when they would walk through the door on a Sunday morning and I would see them, I'd smile. And I found that over time I love these people. I know all of the foibles and all the problems and I know the immaturities and I know, I know all of that, but man, when I decided that I was going to love, love began to grow because that's the way it works I owe you four minutes by the way I'll give it back to you one of these Sundays but that's the way it grows you do it so it's practice so how do we gain this practical knowledge that teaches us how to live read and hear the word of God read and hear the word of God Follow the footsteps of Jesus and mentors who go before you, who will help you like a dad, who will teach you how to live. And then practice. Put it into practice. And the more you practice and the more you live it, the richer it will become. And with that, we have covered only two of eight amplifiers in Second Peter. But this one, can change everything. So Father, we decided a long time ago that we were sinners. We felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit and we responded to accept your free gift of grace. We decided to follow you, but we found ourselves going in other directions, not a whole lot of following. And Lord, we find our spirits emaciated for a lack of your word. And rather than growing and expanding in our knowledge of the Lord, we find that uh, we're a little dead. So we come before you today and we pray that you would do a work in us as we lay down our lives before you we would learn how to live according to your plan and purpose. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me?